Bills Mafia, what is going on? It's Thursday. You know what that means. We are going to be talking about Brandon Bean's comments, all that is in between the lines with what he said, and John Helmkamp, Joe DeRosa, and myself are going to be doing the final mock draft of the season one week before we are in Detroit. Let's get it. Bills Mafia, what is going on? <laughs> if you uh, if you couldn't tell, that is a brand new intro right there for Buffalo Late Night. I'm amped up, man. That song is awesome. We uh, we put that together right beforehand. You know, worked a little magic, and uh, I hope you love it because tonight's gonna be a fun one. I'm very very excited. Welcome to Buffalo Late Night. I'm your host Thomas Delos here on the Cover One Sports Network. Got a ton to talk about. Got a ton to break down. We are going to really be talking about Brandon Bean's comments, what we think. I have some special guests with John Helmkamp and uh, Joe DeRosa. They are both part of the Cover One team here to talk about all things that we are going to be covering. But before I get any bit deeper, like I said, uh, welcome to Buffalo Late Night. Uh, if you are tuning in, I am glad that you've chosen to be with us this evening. If you are listening later on, happy Friday to you. You can find us free on all social media and streaming platforms, YouTube, Spotify, or however you choose to pod. Uh, guys, want to make sure that you are subscribed to the Cover One One Pass that gives you all the inside information, including some very, very intriguing inside information that Eric himself put out there. And maybe we'll touch on that tonight. Maybe we'll, we'll kind of dabble in that later. But Lots to cover, lots to talk about. Want to make sure you guys are subscribed to uh, the Cover One YouTube page as well as make sure you hit that notification button. It'll let you know every single time one of our Cover One shows is live. But here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get right into tonight's show. Let me bring up two of my favorite people. Uh, first off, we have one of the probably the guy that's been on the show more than anybody else. Uh, the guy that hosts Under Review on Cover One, that is Joe DeRosa. And secondly, the guy that's for his first time, I don't know how it's been this long, but John Helmkamp, who does the uh, cover one draft, I mean, literally all the stuff with Daniel Harms. I mean, they break down so much stuff. Oh, gentlemen, what is going on? Man, I'm a walking, uh, walking hype right now after <laughs> that intro. That was incredible. Uh, I don't even know what to do. I'm like, I should be, I should be head banging the long hair. Just let it out. Let it flow. Should be uh, mm -hmm. shotgunning a beer. I'm not sure what the right uh, plan here is. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I was not prepared to walk into some hard rock <laughs> podcast introing and I loved every second of it. Thomas, I don't know if you were looking at us off screen, but I was head banging with John. 
and uh, my head hurts. I actually, I, I did the this oh. thing, and I think I might have <laughs> given myself whiplash. So if I daze or pass out in the middle of this episode, you know why. Well, uh, Jay Rosa uh, has entered the concussion protocol. Uh, yeah. <laughs> The rest of the show. Well, guys, uh, speaking of which, uh, and I suppose we can kind of talk about this as well, but for anybody that is watching, uh, John, Joe, and myself will be in Detroit next Thursday. We're going to be covering the NFL Draft for Cover 1. So uh, I know I know for myself, I know we've talked to the guys. We're very, very excited to get this opportunity to bring you guys in-depth information, um, interviews, whatever we can get, we are going to do, and it's going to be up to date, up to minute. And I mean, you know, with the NFL, everything is consistently changing second by second. So it's going to be exciting to uh, to really dabble into that. Yeah, man, I'm I'm more than pumped. It's going to be a great experience. I'm looking forward to just the venue to see how it all functions in person. All of the you know, absurd amounts of media personalities we're probably going to encounter and see there and really just to work with you two. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really ready for the uh, the challenge since it's our first time, but also the excitement of the event. It's going to be great. Yeah, yep, I, I, live here, I live here in Michigan, so I'm a two and a half hour drive away. I'm Western Michigan going over to Detroit Rock City. Uh, it's going to be awesome. You know, having been into downtown Detroit a couple times for different sporting events over the last couple years, it's it's a cool it's a cool spot. There's like a nice little kind of concourse area between all the different stadiums. It's and I think that's right where the draft center is going to be. So I think it's going to be going to be legit. I can't wait. Um, hey, man, Michigan loves their sports. Uh, they're going to be passionate about it. They're going to bring some energy. I can't wait to see what the Lions fans are up to. It's going to be a good time. Um, but I'm just pumped, man. It's going to be going to be a great experience. We're going to be drinking from a fire hose for three days straight. I can't <laughs> wait. It's going to be awesome. We're going to we're going to bring it all. Bring the noise. It's going to be good. Yeah, it's definitely uh, definitely an exciting time ahead. Now, speaking of the draft, Brandon Bean, Sean McDermott, and Josh Allen had uh, press conferences today. Spoke to the media. So let's let's start right off the top with Brandon Bean because I, I mean I think that's probably the most kind of important of the three in terms of what was said. Guys, what stood out to you from Brandon Bean today? What, was there something that Brandon Bean said that really kind of caught you, or was there something that you think you know that he talked about that really um, maybe it was more smokescreen than anything else? Joe, you want to go first, bud? Happy to lead. I, you know, I, first off, it felt like what you were expecting. I mean, I wasn't really expecting any, any hand playing, anything of Brandon Bean to be like, Hey, this is what we're going to do in round one and so on and so forth. It really did just kind of seem like more cleanup after the fallout with not fallout. I should say the aftermath of Stefan Diggs being traded and answering a few more questions about that. But there were some interesting comments. Really the one that stood out to me was really about how he was talking about first round picks and how, you know, it would have to be the most, I'm paraphrasing it, but basically have to be something that you couldn't say no to, to give up your first round pick. And, you know, I, we've been talking about trading up for the potential of the fall of whether it's neighbors or Dunze in that top 10. And, you know, whether you think it's worth it to give up a first round pick, but it's kind of interesting to hear from the GM's mouth that it would take an offer. He couldn't refuse to do it because I think that just speaks volumes to the process of the draft in general for all GMs, not even just Brandon Bean, because we speculate for months about what are they doing? What's their plan? Bean's got to have a plan. I think it should be viewed more as Bean has multiple paths that he could follow based on months of planning for this outcome or this outcome or this one. So it kind of just reassures that even though it's not a concrete thing and there are multiple paths, it is something that they'll entertain if a player worth trading up for happens to fall or something of the sort. So I liked hearing him speak about it. I really am excited to see what they do in this draft because after the Diggs trade, I mean, receivers are glaring need. How are they going to address it? Do they feel it's as important to go for it in the first round? Or do they think that, hey, you know, we don't think this is as big of, a, of an issue if we have to wait until 28 or even trade down? So that was really what stood out to me. But otherwise, you know, pretty standard as usual GM stuff. 
Yeah, I'll uh, I'll piggyback there. Um, I completely agree with that that conversation that he had about future future first round draft pick and the willingness or unwillingness to trade them uh, was really interesting. He referenced during his his media availability answering that question uh, his time with Carolina and how they were pretty eager to give away future first round picks and moves that they felt like were going to help them, and then how they felt almost regret about it later. He's like more times than not. When we when when it came time, it was like, hey, we could have been picking 17th. This is a player that we could have had there, and and they're they're kind of kicking them for it, themselves for it. He did also bring up the Diggs trade, though. He did say, hey, we did it for Diggs. We gave gave away a future first uh, to to go get Diggs. Um, he he said during during that whole conversation, he was like, it's easy to put it on the credit card today and worry about next year's first next year but you have to be smart about it. And then said, listen, we did for Stefan Diggs. We were working through that. So if there's something that makes too much sense, then heck yeah. Like that was his his quote to the media about that. So it's definitely a possibility. He also alluded to, he's like, I, I can't tell if we'll go up, go back, or draft at 28. I have no idea how it's going to fall. So I think to Joe's point, it's all about preparation. It's knowing what your avenues are. It's knowing how to pivot based on what happens because no one knows exactly what's going to happen on, on draft night. So it's all about contingency plans. Hey, if there's a really, really early run on receiver, what do we do? Hey, if, if that doesn't happen, the top three go, maybe four go before it's our turn. Is there someone that we really like there at 28? Hey, if this player is available at this team who doesn't need wide receiver and maybe they're excited to trade, like they're they're going through every contingency plan under the sun right now. You have your board right. set pretty much at this point. We're a week out from draft night, one week from today, boys. It's here. We finally, like it is, it is upon us. Uh, so, board, thank God. so at this point, the board's pretty much set for these guys. Now it comes down to phone calls, right? You, you get into this weekend, you get into early next week, and that's when the fronts start on each other. That's when the trade talks start happening. The hey, what are you thinking? What can we do? How can we move here? Like, so at this point, it's set. We just got to figure out how exactly draft night's going to go. No one knows, and be willing to, I think, adjust accordingly. We'll see, though, if he decides to swing something before draft night and be like, yeah, I don't want to leave it up to chance. So let's go get a veteran player that's out there. You know, who, who knows what that might look like? Um, maybe a potentially really huge name, maybe kind of a, a tear down, maybe a Brandon Ayuk, maybe a T Higgins. Get that out of the way before the draft even starts. And that way, you know what you're going to be dealing with and what's left over when you get get up there. So we'll see. It's going to be interesting. But I think I think Bean's got a lot of options available to him. And I think that they're talking through it all right now. Yeah, and I think the one thing that, you know, because afterwards everyone's sitting there saying, and there was a lot of uh, raw emotion after Brandon Bean kind of made it seem like wide receiver was not a big hole. Uh, anybody who's listening, let me let me be very clear. Under zero circumstance does Brandon Bean think that the wide receiver position is not a necessity. In fact, Correct. 31 other general managers are watching what Brandon Bean's saying and saying, bullshit. Okay. To him, like, uh, sure, okay, Brandon, like, you traded uh, four years ago for Stefan Diggs, previously tried to trade for Antonio Brown. We know darn well that wide receiver is a very, very big need for the Buffalo Bills when you have Josh Allen and any team in the NFL. I mean, let's let's just be clear clear here, too. Um, in the NFL, they just made it where hip drop tackles are now not allowed. The NFL is doing everything in their power to make it offensive first so any general manager any scouting staff any coaching staff is going to sit there and say we need to load up on offense that's it that's the only way you win in the nfl nowadays it's not it's not defense it's not the you know the the mid 60s 70s where it was all about defense it's not it is a new age of football it's a score as many points as you humanly can and people can tell you not, but that's what they're trending for. The most, literally, when you watch the NFL, the highest ratings are when it's a gun show. That's what works the best. That's what Roger Goodell knows. That's what he's pushing for. But I promise you, Brandon Bean 100% knows that wide receiver is at the top of the list when it comes to needs. You lost your, you know, Greg Thompson was talking about this a bit ago in the uh, the cover one staff chat. 
we lost our number one. We lost our number two. It's close to 200 targets out the window, not including Sherfield, not including De- Deontay Hardy. You need a wide receiver or two or three. And when it comes down to it, what he's talking about today is merely like John was saying, like Joe was saying, it's one, it's CYA covering your ass to make sure that at all costs, he knows he's got a backup plan because like everybody knows, the draft is there is no science. Mock drafts, which we're going to do today, is no science. There is, there's never been a perfect mock draft because it's literally impossible to do. You don't know what 32 GMs are going to do. You have no idea how they're going to dictate the draft, what trades are going to happen, how decisions are going to be made. You know, when you got general managers like Jerry Jones who do things out the seam of their pants and make decisions very willy nilly, you know that it's impossible to to kind of guesstimate what's going to happen. So, in terms of what's happening, I think. Brandon Bean laid it out beautifully, and he does it. He did it like he does it every other time. He says absolutely nothing and says a ton of words. Hmm. He he gives you correct literally an entire dictionary of words, but says nothing in there. There's nothing nothing to write home about because literally, what is he? Why is he going to tell you? And he even yeah. told he even said it in the press con or the uh, media scrum. They've still got mock drafts to do. They've st- which I don't fully believe i'm sure it's probably just like john was saying working through kink seeing if there's any other thing you know what's the other shoe to drop but they've been working on this for a full calendar year now they pretty much know any contingency plan that they're going to come up with and so let's let's kind of let's move alongside with that john you mentioned this you know in terms of potential opportunities to go ahead and maybe make a trade and we'll use this in terms of what our mock draft is going to be in just a bit how do you guys put yourself in position? What are, what are your thoughts in terms of trades? And is there trades that you think will really dictate Brandon Bean's decision-making? Because at 28, obviously you know you're at the mercy of 27 other teams and what's going to happen. Do you think in this situation with the drastic need that you have to be aggressive? Is it a go-get-a-veteran guy like you know, a T Higgins, a Brandon, Ayuka, Justin Jefferson, or going and trading up for a Brian Thomas jr. What do you guys think? Is this one of those years that with all this capital, what we have with Brandon means commentary about how next year's picks don't hold the same weight. Do you go ahead and maybe be more aggressive utilizing that Minnesota pick from next year to get what you want before the getting gets gone? So I think this the answer to your question truly depends on how Brandon Bean thinks Joe Brady's offense will function in a practical way this upcoming season. I think there is a world where if the first eight picks, uh, you see maybe Marvin Harrison Jr. go, you see Malik Neighbors go, but there's an Odunze there at Chicago. I think that there is an opportunity there to make that trade because Chicago outside of the first round at one and nine have two picks left. So you could put together a package where you say, okay, we know that you need more draft capital. You have DJ Moore. You also, uh, you know, you have a plethora of options in this offense to pair with Caleb Williams, a line that's being built a better defense. But naturally, you would probably want to have more options. So if you see Odunze maybe make it to nine, I think that's the first thing Brandon Bean would consider is, all right. Let's see if we can put a package together. Let's let's talk about it. Do they want next year's first? Do they want one of the seconds next year? Do they want this year's? Whatever it may be. Let's try to put together a package we like that they might like and see if it works. If they say no, or if it ends up in a situation where by that Bears pick, all three of those receivers are gone, then it's a matter of, okay, what are my what's my next best option? Probably Brian Thomas Jr. Are you willing to trade up for BTJ or do you feel like there are other options for you there at 28 or even later that you think could complement the offense? And why I say my point earlier with Joe Brady's offense is because if you think that Joe Brady's offense is going to be something where it is a very even spread volume share as far as targets, as far as who's getting it, then I don't think the urgency to trade up is as present because – You saw the second half of last year, and I've made this point on my show. I've made it a few times. People are probably sick of it. I'll say it again anyways. 
the second half of last season was a concerted effort to make that offense less dig centric. It did not mean that they didn't use Stefan Diggs. It did not mean that he wasn't a pawn to help the, the defense adjust their coverage so that other guys could eat. And it didn't mean that he didn't get the ball. What it meant was the identity was permeable. A lot of different people were getting the ball. And you look at the construction of the team, even right now, without adding anybody. You have Dalton Kincaid, Dawson Knox, Khalil Shakir, Curtis Samuel, even Matt Collins, who I know people don't want to be a main option, but he will get the ball at times, and James Cook, Ty Johnson. So now you're talking about adding in receivers to a room that you know is going to be getting the ball all over the place. So then that you have to ask, does Brandon Bean think that with the construction of this offense that he wants to distribute numerous assets to go get one X receiver with the understanding that he is going to lose a bunch of capital for a guy that as good as the prospect may be, might not be considered a feature piece because that just might not be how Joe Brady runs his offense in general. And we spoke about this earlier in our chat, Thomas and John, we talked about, you know, the targets that are being vacated. And I said, I think it's more likely I stress, I think it's more likely, not that I think this won't happen, not that I think they wouldn't make the trade. There are many roads they could take. But I think it is more likely that this speedster, someone that they could have go down the field, someone that could be over six foot one, could have a role that is more similar to what Chosen Anderson had in Carolina, where he still had a thousand yards, than a Stefan Diggs esque role, where this guy is much more of a gadget cog in the machine, using his speed and field stretching ability to complement the rest of the offense rather than be a prototypical X. So, to answer your question with my long winded answer, I think it's going to depend on how this board falls in the top 10 if Odunze is realistic, just because I think that they do would, would really like the prospect if he's there. And sometimes you just you say, F it, let's go, let's do this. But if the world happens where they don't want to give up assets because they feel Joe Brady's offense is more of a distributive offense that's going to be evenly sending the ball around, then there might not be urgency. And honestly, you could find the guy that fills the role you need in the second round or even later. So that's my understanding of it. Here's my attempt to take what Joe just said and make it shorter. I think... <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I've been saying in our group chat for months that Chicago was a possibility for a trade down at nine. I still think it's a really good possibility because of all the reasons that you just said. You're drafting the first overall pick at quarterback. You have very limited draft capital. I could see Chicago looking at the situation and, hey, we need to restock the cabinets a little bit. We need some more capital. We need more assets to come into this team. The way that I see it right now, I think trying to get up for Odunze or or Malik Neighbors, let's say that either one of them starts to fall. Let's say Roma Dunze goes as a second wide receiver off the board, which absolutely could happen. He's an incredible prospect. Depending sure. on, it's all just preference in terms of style, right? Like if you want that boundary guy, great body control, really good route running, more size, more of a boundary X type guy, it's Roma Dunze. If you want someone who's a little bit more of a Swiss army knife, a little bit more of a yak guy with blazing athleticism, lightning fast in and out of his cuts, looks like, you know, rookie OBJ on the field. And that's not just the LSU helmet talking. Then it's, it's um, the Malik neighbors. You have a couple of great wide receiver prospects. So whichever way it goes, and it just depends on how the team looking at type of receiver, the prototype they want, Roman Dunze could absolutely be the second wide receiver off the board. I don't think that's even a question. Um, there's also talk of Malik Neighbors being the first wide receiver off the board. Like, we don't know. But any of these top three wide receivers, in my opinion, are worth going up and getting if there's a team that wants to move down and restock. And to me, Chicago is the most likely candidate for that at nine. So it makes total sense. If it's not that, I don't see a need to trade up for Brian Thomas Jr. I just don't see it. Brian Thomas Jr. had an incredible year, year in 2023, acting as the number two option in his offense, where his route tree was very limited to basically just goes and digs. There was very little horizontal move that was required for Brian Thomas Jr. in his route tree. He doesn't have that flexibility right now. He could develop. I'm not saying that he can't develop that ability. These same conversations were had about like DK Metcalf when he came out. It was the same thing. He was a true X. He was going to run a nine or a curl. And that was basically it. 
Okay. Brian Thomas Jr. is basically that with what he was asked to do last year. I don't see great flexibility in his hips or great hip sync or quickness and cuts to his route tree. Can he develop? Absolutely. But if you want a guy that is just really, really fast on the outside to run a nine route for you, there's many other wide receiver prospects in this draft class that I think will be available at 28. So I think the most likely scenario is probably that we stick and pick. I think that it's it's fun to talk about other options. If the right opportunity present it's, presents itself and we can go get a proven veteran asset to walk right in, great. I'm I'm awesome with that, and I would love it. Trading up for Brian Thomas Jr., to me, would be like my third favorite option just because I don't see the need to give away more assets for Brian Thomas Jr. when you could have an Xavier Worthy a Troy Franklin, like there's multiple other wide receivers that I think will probably be available at 28 that can give you most of what Brian Thomas Jr. has has to offer and that also have better production profiles. Like mm-hmm. I, both Xavier Worthy and, and Troy Franklin have multiple years of proven success at a power five level. Brian Thomas Jr. has one option operating as his own team's number two. So I, I think there's there's concerns there and questions about whether or not it's worth trading up into the teens, which is probably what it would take to get a Brian Thomas Jr. When I can get a comparable prospect, maybe a prospect that even ends up being a better NFL wide receiver than Brian Thomas Jr. at at 28. Or just go out and get Brandon Ayuk, who I love, and you get the stud that's still plenty young and a great route runner, and go get him. And I'm not willing to bring up that other player yet thomas i'm not i'm not saying that name we're not doing it right now (laughs) you know i i agree with both of what you're saying i think trading up in in a vacuum is an interesting prospect just because i think you know they're the potential of getting the guy that you want is great but like brandon bean said you better not miss that's i mean that is absolutely paramount if you are going to trade up to go after a guy, you better make sure that whoever you're trading up for is absolutely who you think he is. You know, and we've talked about this before. Brandon Bean's ammo is a fourth. He always uses a fourth to whatever a fourth gets him, that's where he goes. And so I we got a I couple that, of those, so that works hmm. out. Quite a few. Um yep. and then kind of to what you were saying at the end there, John, and you know, Joe, I don't mean to keep just acknowledging him just he spoke second but um you know in terms of veteran wide receivers i i do think there's something to be said for and joe you mentioned this earlier in the chat going after a guy that you know what you're getting holds a lot of worth Mm -hmm, knowing that you're bringing in a guy that is a vested just a absolute stud of a receiver that you can line up with Josh. Like I, and I understand Brandon Bean said earlier, Josh is beyond the point where he needs to have a number one, which is bullshit. He's beyond the point where you have to insulate him with a guy, which is bullshit. It's the NFL. Every, every quarterback needs a number one receiver, but, right. um, and, and for side note, hey, and Daniel harms, I don't care. Uh, for anybody ah. that wants to say the chiefs fans don't have a number one receiver, Yes, they do. They have Travis Kelsey, the greatest tight end to ever play the game. So, like, it just hop off. But so, hey, um, guess what? We also have Dalton Kincaid. I just want to. I just want to put that in there. Right? Who's um, apparently who going to turn into gonna, Travis Kelsey? Yeah, he's he's taking the mantle. He's next up. Yeah. He, he called next. It, he put you know, like uh, when you were shooting pool. He's the one that's got the quarters on the rail. He's like waiting his turn, <laughs> and then he's going to hop in and, and take over. So there we go. He's got a date like Olivia Rodrigo then or something. He's got to find like a really popular he's a, he's a handsome boy okay there we go. are uh, is there an eta on the actual mock draft yes we're going to be wrapping up our rambling <laughs> just a moment, we that. should stop talking we should stop talking get, this time. close the pff into- screen i got six more points to make <laughs> we're here for two um, more hours okay you know let's just get right into this but i will i will finish up with what i was saying that i think going after a veteran receiver uh, like an Ayuk, like a Higgins, like a he who shall not be named, um, is is definitely an option. I think it's something that I think Brandon Bean a hundred percent would be interested in because of the fact that right now, because I at, at the end of the day the contract is irrelevant. 
The cap's going to keep going up. They've got the money to be able to afford it. I don't think Brandon Bean truly cares. I mean, he cares about the, the cap, but, I mean, he spent a shit ton of money on Von Miller. He spent a ton of money on other players. If he wants to go and get a guy that he knows is going to make Josh Allen the, you know, the Super Bowl champion, money is not an issue. Money's not an it's, – it's nothing to him. So um, I think it's one of those that Brandon Bean will get the guy he desires – um, moving forward, before we get into this, and, and, and thank you, Ian, for, again, always reminding me of things. Um, guys, I talked about this at the top of the show. Cover One One Pass brings you all the great stuff. Like we talked about, there's some very interesting media information that was dropped by Eric Turner earlier. Uh, to be able to get into this Cover One Slack chat, you got to be part of the Cover One One Pass. So no other than Aaron Quinn and Greg Thompson tell you all about it. Many people ask us the best way to support us here at Cover One, and that is to sign up to become a Cover One One Pass member. That contribution helps give us the access to all the data and information we use to create the content that you love. And I think most importantly, brings you into our community of insiders. It's a great community based on Slack. I know a lot of people don't want to be on social media anymore or be in on those conversations. We bring all of it to you right in our great community of educated fans. And most importantly, you get access to our content creators. Even better than that, everybody loves merch. You get awesome t-shirts, a cool decal, and a letter from the Cover One team signed directly to you. All for $60. That gets you the entire season, next year's free agency and draft. 60 bucks. Click the link in the description. Cover One Insider. Become one today. And speaking of that, uh, let me tell you all about our sponsor here at Cover One. That is Underdog Fantasy. I'm going to knock it all out in one sw- just full swoop. Uh, Underdog Fantasy is, ex- or Cover One's excited once again partner with the most dynamic name of fantasy football, Underdog Fantasy. Uh, I want to tell you all about the easiest way to get some action in NFL. It's Underdog Fantasy in their pick'em game. Just pick higher or lower on your favorite or least favorite player stats, and you can win up to 20 times your money in a single night. Underdog keeps it super simple with their easy to use website and mobile apps. Pick between two and five players to fill out your pick'em entry and get every pick right. Take home some cold hard cash. You go cover one. And get your first deposit double up to two hundred dollars by Underdog Fantasy. There we go. So I did that just to uh, be able to get right into the action for you guys, so you'd stop complaining and yelling at me. And we are going to move right into this mock draft. Which Ian, if you can bring it a little bit bigger for old people like Roy Collins, otherwise he's going to yell at me because the Damn. font is too small. Um, he yells at me every single week. I do a mock draft because I don't have it large enough for him to see. So to avoid any of that. I'm going to make it bigger. Um, But so what we're going to do here is we are going to do this as Brandon Bean. The three of us are going to make decisions in what we believe Brandon Bean would do. Whatever that decision is, it is going to be in lockstep. Everything is going to be full. So uh, that being said, how do these uh, settings look for you guys? Is everything, how do you, how do you guys typically like these? I I usually do like midway between fast and the slowest it can be because I do I don't want it to like drag on but I also think it still gives you a chance to like keep up with it without it going crazy so I, I'm sure. cool with that otherwise everything's fine okay good 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 yep so there we go so let's go ahead and enter the draft right now and we are going to get going ladies and gentlemen if you haven't been part of this before by the way uh, I appreciate you guys all watching this is Buffalo Late Night. Go ahead, hit the thumbs up, uh, rate, review, share, like, let everybody know about the show and all the shows on Cover One. We do very much appreciate that. Um, if you do not know how this goes, you guys are part of this. So if you want us to do something, if you guys think something, uh, throw it in the chat. Let us know. Super chats are live. So if you want to be heard, hit that super chat. It will literally bring it to the screen and I will read it. And uh, we'll get to it. So uh, let me go ahead and zoom in on this. I apologize. There. there. Uh, uh, a precursor oh, juicy. here. Beautiful. I love it. A precursor here as we get moving. Um, I, I just, I want you to keep tabs on those top three wide receivers, right? So if, if one of them starts to get out of the top five, six picks, let's just like take it easy, you know, quickly uh, click that pause button let's just kind of take a look and see if there's anything that we're interested in doing here so let's just i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna bring the speed down just at the beginning yeah yeah that's fine we can we can ramp it up as we get the later rounds but here early i think we should uh make sure we're seeing what's happening 
Which, uh, before we get going, by the way, if you miss the beginning of this, John, Joe, and myself are going to be in Detroit next Thursday, so a week from tonight, covering the NFL draft, uh, credentialed, which is very exciting to say out loud. Uh, We will be on Media Row with the rest of all the all the pundits and podcasters and all the people. Uh, so make sure you hit us with a follow. All of our handles are below our faces. So make sure you hit with us a follow, and uh, we're going to be putting out some pretty awesome content Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So let's get going and uh, see how this goes. I'm going to stop it at 5, see how we're looking. And uh, right out of Ooh. the gate. No you- way. You've got uh, Roma Dunze going fifth to the Chargers. Malik Neighbors going fourth to the Cardinals. All three quarterbacks going there, and then the Giants are on the clock with Marvin Harrison Jr. I can't imagine Marvin Harrison Jr. going, but you never know. Chargers absolutely could love Roma Dunze and Malik Neighbors going to the to the uh, Cardinals. But, uh, gentlemen, any thoughts at this point? Hey, Joe Shane. Hey, Joe Shane. Yeah. What's uh, going on? Marvin Harrison Jr. dropping to six would intrigue me just because when it's the Giants and you think you could rub a little elbow with uh, your old buddy from your org, I think it's worth it to see. But you'd, you're you going to have to give up a freaking haul if Marvin Harrison Jr. is there. And I, I love the prospect. It's all a matter of if you guys think it's worth it. Here's, here's where I'm at right now with the pick. If this is the scenario that plays out, I know how much you, Marvin Harrison Jr. is incredible. Do you think that there would be a world here where Joe Shane would consider J.J. McCarthy because of the way that Daniel Jones has been playing and the injury history and his contract and all that stuff? Or do you just look at this and go, we're going to give – arguably the best wide receiver prospect in multiple seasons to Daniel Jones. And if he doesn't succeed with Marvin Harrison Jr., then there is no saving him. That's the way that I see it going. I, I think that's a possibility, to be honest with I mean, there, and even if you don't like him, there are a number of quarterbacks on the free agent market that you could bring in. I mean, Andy Dalton is still floating around out there if you sure. really didn't believe in it. So, yeah, I mean – the likelihood that Joe Shane passes up on potentially the best wide receiver prospect since Jamar Chase. Mm. I doubt it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think they're trading this pick. If this is how it pans out, I I don't see, I mean, it it would be, it would be a truckload and I don't know that that's the route that we want to get here. And the, the cost to even get up, that's not, there's no way that's right. Yeah, I I have the um, I'm using over the caps calculator right now, and they use the Fitzgerald Spielberger evaluation for all those people that were dying to know what they use. So I put in 28 overall next year's first and a 2025 second, and for the Giants I put in sixth overall and number 70. So our value is up on theirs by about three mil total because it uses like a cash valuation. So I would say. If you wanted to see if they would bite on that, because then in this scenario, you'd get the six and you get the third rounder back while keeping your second. I would just be curious, but I doubt they'll oh, actually let that happen. Or they will, because I'm looking at your screen finally, and I see that the trade will be accepted just for that. But see if you could slip in the third rounder. I don't know if that changes it. Um, no, the, uh, their third rounder, I should say. So we give them oh, seven next year's first, and gotcha. then I give them Buffalo's round two. So about forty. Yeah, yeah that's forty. That's pretty 45%. close. Yeah, I don't. I don't like it though. I don't. I don't see a world where Brandon Bean's given yeah. up that much to come up. For I don't even think, I mean, to be honest with you, that just does not seem enough to get up that high. Two firsts yeah, in yeah. a second. It just seems not enough. In compare, I mean, if you have to think the the Julio Jones trade was what five or six pieces. Yeah, they probably they probably would want to, especially because when you're talking about the top 10, too, I don't know what the baseline difference in value would have to be for it to be worth it. Because just because the bills are giving you slightly more might not be enough. They might want more than just a three mil difference. So I'm I'm only looking at it from the metric of breaking even. But it could be like you'd have to slip in like a fourth or maybe a second or something like that. But yeah, I am in agreement that I'm willing to just let them let them take him or see if Harrison drops any further and then try something else. Yeah, we'll we'll see what happens. My guess is he's not he's not going to get past the Titans, but we'll give it a whirl. 
And he's oh, no, they took him. All right, cool. Let it rock. Let it go. So go all the way to 28 at this point? I think so. Let's pause it right here just real quick, though. I want to be... Okay, so at this point, the Colts are a team that I think interests me. If if Brandon Bean does think that Brian Thomas Jr. is worth it, I think the Colts at 15 are a team that stands out to me as a, as a possibility, which obviously mm-hmm. we just we just passed that number with, with them taking Terry on Arnold. But I just want to bring this up as like a potential – hot spot in the draft i think right in here 14 to 16 right in there um john schneider in seattle loves a trade down more than anybody i've ever mm-hmm. seen in the history of the nfl so that could be another possibility right. here too even even right now with with them on the clock at 16 he loves trading down he loves accumulating assets he loves his mid-round picks um so that that could be a potential if Bean thinks that it's worth doing again. I don't know that it is to me, but I can also understand it. If you're looking at the size speed combo, your X, your outside guy that, that might have that really upper tier ceiling to him, like a DK Metcalf type, you know, sure. I could see this range right here being where that conversation potentially happens. Hmm. I agree with that. Yeah, I think it's worth it if you if if they value Brian Thomas Jr. that highly to the point where they think the size speed combo is more than just a one trick, or that he'd be so good in that role. Like I said before, like a chosen Anderson role, that it would be like a, a sheer mistake if you didn't take him. Then I think this is a spot where I'd be willing to trade up for. But I'm still in the camp that just like I'm willing to let it go to 28 and see what falls okay. there. Like, but that's just me. I mean, it's it's Thomas's show. It's his draft. It's his baby here. So I mean. I'm willing to let the, the group and you know the comments and Thomas and everyone here decide on that, but I think I'd, I'd pass on it. Yeah, I I think we let this ride a little bit further, see if we can get a little bit you know farther down the board. I, I think at this point, like we mentioned before, I don't know if there's a, a super necessity to go ahead and get one of these guys. Um, it, be honest with you, I think the value is probably closer at 28. And yeah. if Brian, I mean, if Brian Thomas gets to like 25. 26 sure. then sure. we can we can reconvene at that point yeah also uh, i saw someone in the comments asking us to show the players available you can't until it's your turn to pick that's the uh amazing part of the interface of this mock draft right and if you guys right. want we i'm at this point early in the draft if you guys want to switch to pro football network we can also do that too i have that up as well so hmm. um it's whatever you guys want to do i know i've done a lot of pro football focus mock drafts so well, the you comments. Do wanna... What do our what do our people checking us out think? Do they think we should go over to that one, or should we stick with PFF, or what is what yeah, is you the guys, consensus? You, yeah, you guys tell us. Do you want us to stick with this pro football? Because we're only twenty one picks in, twenty picks in. Excuse me, which Brian Thomas Jr. just went to the Steelers. Do we stick with the pro football uh, fo- pro football focus, or do we switch over to the pro uh, pro football? That I hate the fact that their names are so similar. Mm-hmm. Um, we could switch over to that one. That one uh, has the names while you're drafting, so you can see exactly who you're looking at. Um, more player profiles. I do. Uh, is, I yeah. do like the yeah. draft guys over at PFN. I'm friends with them. I got, I got some buddies over there, like Ian and and uh, Ollie Hutchinson. The uh... yeah, let's go PFN. Sure, why not? Let's kick it over. I, I honestly think this is kind of ridiculous with seeing Marvin Harrison Jr. at six. Like, yeah, I, <laughs> but again, you never know. You you never know with the NFL draft. Yeah. Anything could right. happen. So you have to kind of account for a little bit of that chaos. And these are the situations, though, that the front office has to account for, right? Like, they've got to be like, hey, what right. happens if Marvin Harrison Jr. is available at nine? Yeah. Like, what does that look like to us? They're, they're talking through all that, for sure. For I've sure. also had um, PFN mock drafts where Jaden Daniels falls to 28. So <laughs> it's been a so- mixed bag. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll definitely see how this goes. Uh, if you guys don't like it, we're not going back. So we are we are <laughs> heading in one direction, and this is where we're going at this point. So let's go ahead. We're gonna uh, crack this off. See how this looks. Um, we'll do normal speed. Good- if anything changes, I got to figure out. What the- okay, there's the pause. Okay, we'll get to five like we did before. See how it looks. All right, looking accurate. Looking accurate. Yeah, that, that looks a little more like what I'm. Okay. Expecting. Again and again, it could be anything, but like. And this is interesting right here because we had 
Joe Alt go to the Giants. Roma Dunze is absolute. It's gonna be crazy if Drake May falls this far, but <laughs> uh, Roy, if Roma Drake Dunze May, if Drake May is in the lap of any of these teams right here, I think Tennessee they like what they have in Will Levis. I think Atlanta just swung for Kirk Cousins. Um, this is a trade up situation all day long. If if the Tennessee Titans are on the clock at seven and Drake May's there. They're going to be taking phone calls. This is going to be Denver. This is going to be Denver or Las Vegas that are giving a big offer to Tennessee to come up to seven to get Drake May. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I think, think we uh, uh, or Minnesota or more. Minnesota. Right. Absolutely. This is this is tough for me because it's like, do you think Tennessee's nabbing him, or do you think that you, you can wait and see if you can get to nine? I'm I'm so torn I because honestly, a lot. Sorry, John. Sorry to cut you off, too. No, sorry. Oh, you're good, no, man. My you're... Fault. I'm, I'm talking over <laughs> you all day long. I, I think it's... Tennessee I think Tennessee is going offensive line. That's the way that I have it right now is that I think if Olu Fashanu is there at seven, I think that that's their pick. As much as we love Roma Dunze, you have a second-year quarterback that took over halfway through in his rookie season. You need to protect him. You start in the trenches. You get that done. They already went out. They got Calvin Ridley. So you have Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins. Right. Mm. It's not like wide receiver is a that. massive glaring need. I, I think it's offensive line all day for Tennessee. Or in this situation, they're a trade-out candidate for numerous teams that would be clamoring to move up for Drake May in this situation. Yeah. I think I think right now I see Tennessee going tackle. Atlanta is a bit of a kind of a wild card, even though they have Moody and London and Pitts and Robinson. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, would they be psychotic enough to add Odunze to that mix too, and just have the sickest group of wide receivers ever, and then finish seven and ten? I don't know, but I would, I, I would no. I think I think Atlanta is actually going to be pretty good. I'm only joking, but I. I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to see what Tennessee does, and then it's your guys' call if you want to sit and see if Atlanta avoids it or if Atlanta decides to pull the trigger and you want to try that trade there. Well, I, I think John's John's mention of Chicago is probably of worth noting just with the sheer fact that they have four picks. I think getting them a couple extra picks would be of benefit. And like, even though they're rebooting, and you know, obviously in this draft they took Kayla Williams, which is great. The likelihood they're going to be good this year is probably fairly slim, unless Kayla Williams just hits the ground running immediately. So I, I could assume that Ryan Poles, which is Canandaigua native right down the road from us here in Rochester, um, maybe, just maybe, he wants to add a little bit to bolster that team. So, um, But let's go ahead. We'll check to see what the Titans do here and uh, move forward. Oh, and the Falcons oh. took their dudes. Uh, wow. Disgusting. All right, let it rock. Okay. So let we're going to go. go ahead and uh, let it roll here. The <laughs> Okay. Oh, hold on. Pause it. Pause it real quick. Pause it real quick. Because Aaron Rodgers is on, what, one more year, oh. maybe? Like, yeah. isn't it one more year on Aaron Rodgers' contract? Correct. Why not? If he falls into your lap at 10, mm. why not? If, if you got Drake me sitting there, you go, okay, cool. They're apparent. Yeah. We've got one more year. Maybe Rodgers doesn't recover from his injury. Maybe we let him walk in free agency. Maybe this year doesn't go how we want it, whatever. Absolutely, if I'm the Jets, Drake may somehow miraculously is there, which you never know, though. You never know in the NFL draft. But in this scenario with how it played right. out, I could absolutely see the Jets doing that. If Drake may sit in there, be like, okay, cool. Let's go. 100%. And Rodgers will be pissed. And we'll hear about it all off season. And just, we'll hear about how he poured himself four fingers of whiskey right after Drake May was selected, <laughs> just like he did with Jordan Love. Yeah. It'll be great. It's awesome. I mean, I, I think Rodgers has to be self-aware. I would want to assume he's self-aware enough to realize he's in his 40s and that he can't play for another 10 years. Like the Jordan Love one made a little more sense as to why he'd be angry. But this one, if he got mad that they took a rookie when he's uh, 40, I think right. at that point you got to kind of look in the mirror. But that's a metaphorical anger, so – I, I can't imagine that Aaron Rodgers has um, any introspection, but you know, here we are. He's the same guy that has decided that he was going to retire, and he was ninety percent sat in a room of darkness, and then decided he was going to go play for the Jets. So uh, let's go ahead. We're going to uh, drop down the draft, see how we look, see where we're kind of just where we're sitting. If there's anything that sticks out to us, obviously you saw Brock Bowers went to the Colts here. 
I know that was something, John, you had mentioned as a potential trade partner. So we'll go ahead. We'll get to um, we'll get to out about 20, 25, see where we're at. And then we get to start pumping because otherwise we'll be here till probably 2 in the morning. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> trade up for Mims, BTJ, and Cindy. Brian. Wow. Law 2 to the Rams, which I think would be sick. Vikings get Penix Jr., which Murphy makes a lot of sense. Texans. Right. Okay. Oh God, Byron Mur- Byron Murphy to the Texans is like my favorite fit landing spot in this draft. Like it makes so much sense, and I love that for them. Need it for us because all of a sudden the Texans are getting really, really good, really, really fast. Um, mm-hmm. But sure. man, that would be a home run for them. Chop Robinson, yeah, that screams Ooh. Tampa Bay to me. I see that all day long. That, that makes a lot of sense. That Arizona trade. 35 and next year's second. And mm-hmm. then, oh, I don't hate that at all because then you have three second round picks if you want to try and use that to get back up in the second round. Or, you know, I'd however go. you want to. Ma- yeah, I would do that in a I'd heartbeat. Go. I wouldn't even think twice. So we take that. Second, I'd take that. Yep. 100%. Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. Easily Great. done. Let's take that and see Trading what we got going Trading up for going Johnny on. Newton. Sure. We're still and Coleman to the Pats. Have fun. Hey, you guys want another second round pick to pick 44? <laughs> <laughs> no, you okay. want to know what I want? You want to know what I want? I want Xavier Worthy. That's what I want. I think Xavier Let's Worthy in the spot would be really, really nice. Either that or Lad McConkey would be really, really good. Grandpa but I think Xavier Worthy would absolutely be a banger of a pick. I think I think at this spot. Because what's our next pick? It's still sixty, right? Because we didn't get anything else. So I mean, well, 60. we can take we can take those two the two seconds from next two year. Seconds for Let's next move year. back up. Yeah, yes. and move I th- them. I would go. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking we take. I fucking love McConkey, but I think I'd go Worthy here. Yeah, and then I would try to maybe see if I could package like something with that pick we just got. And try to get up and get like maybe if you think you can get what get to if you're feeling frisky. Let, let me ask you guys this: What about Lad? Because honestly, so, they him. met Brandon Bean has met with Lad a ton. Yeah. They have met Here, with here's Lad. Here's my thoughts on my thoughts on Lad McConkey. So Joe, I I joined your show mm-hmm. about a month ago, and and we discussed this potential for Lad McConkey at 28. And I think that's that's when it wasn't getting as much smoke as it's as it's getting now. So I'm glad to hear the lad hive is is rising. And uh, there's a lot of talk about him being potential a, a late first round pick. Absolutely. If not, right here, high second makes a lot of sense for where lad's going to go. Lad McConkey is just really, 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 really good at football, and he's yeah. really, 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 really good at separating. He's not a slot receiver. Get that out of your head. He lined up predominantly on the outside in college, mixed in with some slot. We, we've talked about this with Joe Brady's offense. You want guys that are just kind of interchangeable chess pieces and that mm-hmm. people don't know what you're going to get from each guy. So there's multiple schools of thought with how we're approaching this draft from, from Bill's fandom. You're either going to get an outside guy where everyone knows that he's the outside guy, or you're adding another chess piece like Aladdin McConkey, and then the defenses have no idea who's going where. Maybe mm-hmm, you put right. them in a bunch formation. Maybe you put that person in motion. Maybe you do whatever. But if you just want a guy that understands football, who is arguably the best route runner in this class, like Marvin Harrison Jr. is in a stratosphere to himself, but Lad McConkey is dirty dirty route runner. I mean, he leaves mm-hmm. guys in the dust consistently and he just gets open. Mm. I don't care if he's going to catch a 40 yard nine route on the sideline posterizing two defensive players. If he gets open 15 yards down the field and turns it into 40 yards with 25 yards, a yak, it's all the same thing. So if right. you just want the guy that can get open, that you can get the ball to, Lad McConkey is great. Oh, and he also tested fantastically athletically. So mm, he has sure. the athleticism and the yak ability and all that stuff where to me, he's a great fit in a Joe Brady offense. And he's just going to find himself wide open. And Josh Allen's going to be like, Hey, thanks for the layup. You know, just like, Oh, yeah. there's lad. I just, 
him on yeah, that little I, app route and he's wide open. I see I see that logic for both. And I think I, I adore McConkey. Everyone knows I'm a huge Lad McConkey fan. I think even though he I've seen people say like, oh, Georgia beat writers, he will be in the slot, mainly in the NFL. And I think he would get slot play a lot. I think Lad McConkey is a separator. And I think that's the thing that yep. this Bills offense really does value. And I think you don't have to be six six or six five or have a man like an insane size profile to be a good receiver for the Bills and to be a downfield threat for them. I think my logic for Worthy here, apart from just, you know, who I like more, Worthy to me is the sp- is faster. I think not just in his 40 time, but just in game speed is faster. And I think when I talk about someone who I trust a little bit more, if you're asking them to fit that conventional speed profile and someone that you send up field more often, as much as I love lad, I think I'd rather take worthy knowing that we have Curtis Samuel, who I think that in that spot, lad and him, I don't want to call it redundant, but I feel like Curtis can give you a veteran presence that kind of gives you the role Lad would give you if you didn't have Curtis. So I would rather I take Worthy. Okay, let's I go ahead and do that. Worthy. Xavier Worthy is my wide receiver four in this draft class. Yeah. So the other thing I want to ask right before we do this is, do we want to trade back into the second? And while we're here, is there a person that maybe we're going to target? Like a Ruga ro 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 or Anis Rackstraw, who can play both corner and safety. Uh, Chris Braswell, defensive end from, uh, you know, from Alabama that we've met specifically. John, can, can I make a request? If if we're getting to this scenario, which is we have not traded for a veteran wide receiver, we have not successfully traded up. We have traded back into the second. And I see Brandon Bean wanting volume at the wide receiver position. Now, yeah. there's a couple things that I want to say here. Safety and edge dry up fast in this draft right. class. They dry up really, really quickly. However, the trade down and getting a, a second next year that maybe we just flip that second plus a fourth and get right back up into this second round for another wide receiver and we just double dip at the position to yes, add like volume it. into the class. I love that and I want to make make a request here. Xavier Worthy I have as my favorite pick here. Len McConkey is my second. I'm a big Troy Franklin guy, which you guys know. But if we're going to wait this out a little bit longer, I'm a big Jalen Polk fan. Yes, And I think he gives you ability on the outside, ability in tested catch situations that might be, if we're building out our wide receiver room like a basketball team where you want guys that can do different skill sets, Jalen Polk offers a different skill set to what the wide receiver room would currently consist of. So that would be a target for me. Or if we make Xavier worthy here, we let this play out down to maybe around 45 to 48 range, something like that. We try to get back up and get Jalen Polk. Double dip there with a speed guy in Xavier Worthy and good route runner with great contested catchability in Jalen yeah. Polk. That would be a really happy wide receiver pair for me. With him. I like it. So let's go ahead. Let's uh, get down to All about right. 43, and then we'll pause. Round of applause, okay. guys. We're 59 minutes into the show, and we made our first pick. There we are. We're doing very well. The rest of this <laughs> is going to go very fast if you're watching. I promise you. Wink, wink. Uh, so we are at 44 right now. Um, we could go ahead and trade up, or we could wait a little bit longer and I'll try wait. to see. With, Frank- with Franklin and Leggett still on the board, show me the, the all. Everyone, everyone that's still on the board here at For other sure. positions. Oh, Wayne's Dubin, uh, Ruka, Ruff, 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 Ruff. Uh, Okay, there's still, there's still some guys here. I think you can give this a little bit longer. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm content thinking. waiting this out. Maybe 48 there, Jacksonville might be a. Okay. Might be a Let's go ahead and we'll get to 48. And, and something I've ushered to, like if you're someone who likes that Packers approach that I've been talking, you know, because I love the way they built their room, like they attacked a lot of skill positions in the second and third round. Like they got their tight ends in the second round. They got uh, Jaden Reed in the third. They added Dontavian Wicks, I think, in the fifth round, if I remember correctly. Like, but they devoted a lot of assets in those two rounds there. So, like, if Bean is approach is to make the room well rounded, like you said, John. I'm seeing, you know, a tr- like if this were the scenario, 
trade back up into the second and try to make that happen. If you have to use one of the new second round picks you got to try, because that's essentially a third. So you essentially try to use that and you have three of them. So, I mean, I'd be willing to part with one. Then that's something that I would try to do here. And I think I love the Jalen Polk one. I also love Leggett. If you think Leggett's going to fall to you. Uh, yeah, man. I also think if you wait, you genuinely could wait till 60. And I think you'll still have one I'm, of those names for you there. I'm starting to think that like, I'm looking at this board and I'm like, we're only 12 picks off from 60. There's right. still a you few just wait it guys out? that make me happy. Maybe we wait it out. I mean, the Jets trading up for Troy Franklin would break my heart. Um, if that happened in real life, that mm-hmm. makes me super, super sad um, right. as an Oregon guy. But I'm looking at the board right now and I'm just going, oh, man, maybe we can maybe we can ride this out. Let's maybe give it a few. Oh, Ricky Pearsall. OK, that'd Ricky be another Pee-pee. option. Yeah, oh, Robert Wilson, Pee-pee. Malachi Corley. There's quite a few options it, right I, here. This spot. To me is like it's kind of the same things that, like I said about McConkie, but I just think Pearsall's really freaking good. And when you get to this spot in the good. draft. It's also like, well, we can't be – beggars can't be choosers. Like, you can't, you know, be too picky because then the guy's gone and you have no options. So, I say let's I, – I wanted to trade up, but now seeing the board, I say let it go to 60. Yeah. I think we'll have an option. Okay. For the sake let's of run. time, let's get to 60 here. Let's see what we're looking at. So, let's see. Still no. Still no. This up at all? Still no. no. <laughs> I right, Polk to the Dolphins. Polk to Miami pisses me off. Uh, we get to the Xavier Packers. Leaves. Get out of here. Packers have a hell of a uh, hell of a room. So right here we got Malachi Corley, Roman Wilson, Ricky Pearsall. That's a nice group. Give me a uh, mm-hmm. at number sixty. What? Well, let's Ricky let's take a look real quick before we uh, before we make that selection. What else is available? Leonard oh, Taylor is definitely an option. Michael Hall is an Hall. option. Um, so good. Go to Cor- look, take a look at safeties. Real sure. quick. Still, Bishop. still loaded. Pretty much. You could honestly, Jayden, we Jayden we could potentially Hicks. use one of our seconds to move up and actually get like Cole Bishop, J- Javon Bullard. If if Jayden we're Hicks. moving back up, I'd want to go for D line, but I wouldn't hate it. Um. All right. Uh, what were you saying a, about Jaden Hicks, John? Here is that I love him. I I think Jaden oh, okay. Hicks is one of the safeties <laughs> in this draft class. <laughs> He's a he's a hit stick waiting to happen. I I think that he would be a Sean McDermott guy all day long. I think that Sean McDermott would love Jaden Hicks. So I think that would be tempting to him at sixty. Um, we're gonna have to wait a long time unless we can swing a trade up. To uh, I'm he's cool with any. Up a bit. If you want to go receiver here, Thomas, I'm cool with any of those three. But I think my preference would probably be Ricky PP. Same. Yes, Rick, Ricky Pierce all as well. Okay. Do it, and so. I think we go ahead and we trade up as well, to be honest with you, yeah. to try to get one of these defensive tackles. Um, we might be able Bullet to get. A... Oh, hold on. I, I want Fisk. Oh, Fisk just went. God damn it. Fisk and Hall back to back. So wait, who who's still on the D tackle room? Oh, I still Chris like Jenkins. Those names, though. Chris Jenkins. We can wait a little bit, maybe trade up oh. to get Dwayne Carter. I love Dwayne Carter. Um, Dwayne, Dwayne Carter is one of my guys for sure in this draft. Yep. Class. Um, Big, big fan of him. Uh, him and Hicks, that's tough. I'm a big fan of both of them. I, Marshawn I think Nealon at this point, is still available as well. I I like Booker, too. I like Jalex Hunt, too. But I, I'm not trading up for an edge. I, if I'm trading up for anybody, it's DT. But honestly, in, in PFN Sim, I've seen Carter fall to the 90s. And I've seen him fall to the Bills there. I think if we hit like the 80s and we still see like if you're comfortable waiting till 90, we could. If you, if you get like the mid 80s and you see Carter still there, I would be willing to try and flip up to get to secure that. I'm also a Carter guy. I'm biased, mind you. Yeah, let's go ahead. We'll get to like 85, see where we're at and see if we could potentially get up to maybe get Dwayne Carter. I love our receivers, though. I'm cool with Worthy and PP. For sure. Okay. Lots. We are now at the Browns right here. Uh, still have um, Dwayne Carter available Mason at this Smith's spot. On the board too. Who is no. Mason Smith? No, he just went. Oh, uh, well, he went to where did he go? He's here. I don't. Somewhere. Oh, there he is. He? Oh, he is. is. Oh, he is still on the board. Yeah. 
So hmm. that's a buffer, but you never know if they go back to back. If the Texans decide, hey, let's add another D lineman, um, <laughs> or Cleveland who takes D line like seven times in every draft they're in. But do we try to trade up with the Browns to secure one of our guys, considering we have that extra second? <laughs> I'm comfortable with doing that. However, I don't know if you guys would want to do that or if you think waiting till 90 and the chances, because it's five picks. I mean, do you think Smith and Carter are gone in five picks? I also really don't want to take Devondre Sweat. I like Wingo, though. Wingo as a rotational pass rusher would be fun, but I'd rather have Smith or Carter. So that's up to you guys here. So uh, Keith Randolph, the other Illinois defensive tackle, is actually pretty interesting to me too much later. I think that might be if if we don't pull it off right here, if we're not able to get one of those guys, that name that I'm good with waiting on and trying to come back to later, um, as mm-hmm. just kind of a rotational defensive tackle that we can throw in there. Mason Smith, man, he was a year ago being talked about as a potential first round pick. So right. that's interesting to me right here. Is um is my Wazu safety still available? Oh, wait, we don't have 90. I'm an idiot. Yeah, we don't have 90. I kept, I thought we had 90 for a second. Whoops. So, Jaden Hicks, Hicks, is, still Hicks there. is still there. So, we'll have to trade up regardless. I, yeah, I had my I had that old PFF 90 in my head and that comp pick that we never got. My bad. Go ahead and try to see if they will let us come up. Um, let me try to see if I can do 133 in a second so we could still keep 128 and potentially get up to maybe get Jaden Hicks in that moment. So let me try a third next year. Go third. Let's see if go third. And then we'll go there. Who is this Cleveland we're trying to trade with? Yeah, yeah. we're not going to do it with that. So we might have to use one of our seconds. We're going for 85. So we would need to give them – I mean – Next year's third, and what would you give them? 133? 133 and a third, and they didn't take yeah. it. So you'd have to 133 the and a bit. second. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe like Buffalo second, so you can keep that Minnesota second if they have the worst record. Okay. There you go. And they did All accept right. that. And it's, it's not a terrible discrepancy in value either. It says 5 million here, but again, like there's going to be guys that are right. going to try and ring you out for a pick. So that's right. what it is. So go ahead and what do you what do you guys think? Do we take do we do safety here and get DTD or do we do defensive tackle? We got Mason Smith or Dwayne Carter. I like Mason Smith. I think if yeah. you get a good defensive line coach with Mason Smith, I think you unlock a freak. And there's there's very few guys in this draft with his measurables. Just yeah. I'm sheer size. I'm good chasing I'm good chasing upside there on Mason Smith. Um I, I yeah. think I think that would be a great trade up scenario for a guy that, like I said a year ago, was being talked about as a potential first round pick. Now you're getting the middle of the third. Um, right. We traded down from the first to the second. We still got the wide receiver that we wanted. We picked up a second to use that to move back up. Now we're getting a freakish athletic defensive tackle. I'm all in on that. I think that mm-hmm. makes a ton of sense. I'm, I'm good with Mason Smith here. I would love that. I think okay. Mason Smith is the person that I'm the most comfortable rotating in besides Dwayne Carter. But with Mason Smith, again, the upside of what he was prior to his injury, I know that is a cause for concern, but if teams are comfortable with the medicals and the fact that he was able to play, I would do it. And again, I'm someone who will just always stress going for D-line before the secondary because I just think you win it up front. You you can help your coverage in the back. A guy that can supplement it if Daquan Jones happens to go down or he needs a breather and someone that can play three and someone that I think could also play one, he's a guy I would take there. I'll go for Mason Smith. Okay. Let's go. So we are good. Moving forward, our next picks, we've got 128, 144, and 160. Do we let it run to 128, or is there somebody that you guys feel maybe we jump up for? I can let it go here. Okay. So we'll go ahead and see if potentially. I mean, Jaden oh, Hicks is still F seven. off. F off. What? Atlanta trading up for for uh, Jared Wiley. You <laughs> <laughs> okay? Sure, sure. And Titan, I saw your comment. We got an extra second round pick in our scenario earlier, so that's why we were so comfortable with doing it. If this was normal, which it, that would never, I doubt we would ever get that offer. I don't think we would ever move that second, but for the sake of the exercise and the fact that I think they desperately need DT, I, it's a suggestion, something we could do. But Malik, Malik Mustafa going two picks before me is Oladapo though. Mm-hmm. I like Oladapo. Tyke Smith. Smith. 
yeah, is the one say. that has actually worked with our new defensive backs coach as well. Yeah, that's box safety. Jalex Hunt's still there too. I like so's that. Dwayne, so is Dwayne Carter. Are you serious? Oh, I shit. think you double dip and take Dwayne Carter at the spot, right? I take okay. full accountability for that trade up, guys. I'm sorry. I didn't. Th- I did not think Dwayne Carter was falling here. I am the reason this happened. You can send the pitchforks to me. Did not think he was falling. Um, I'm cool with it, but again, I'm biased. I like Jalex Hunt too, pass rush specialist. Mm-hmm. But Carter, there. I mean, you're talking about fortifying the depth in your room. I think it might be a little overkill if you have Mason Smith, though. Like, if you're talking from like skill set, if you're talking for what you'd actually be using them for, like you still have Jones for two more years. You still have Ed for the foreseeable future. Like Smith to me right. is the guy that you got to eventually fill in for Jones next to Ed. So I don't know if I take Carter here only because like, where do you put him? And he's not going right. to line up on the edge. Whereas there is an edge prospect here with rising ranks that test did pretty well at his pro day. Like I would go, I again, D line, Joe, Jalex hunt. That'd be my pick here. And yes, well, you can always blame me anyway. So, real quick, take a look at the running backs for me, just where we are. Sure. Oh, man. Okay. You know, Marshawn Lloyd sitting there. (laughs) Marshawn Lloyd. I can wait. I can wait, too. Um, I want to keep an eye on a couple guys. I want to keep an eye on Dylan Johnson, who's going to be down the list a little bit further. I want to keep an eye on... Oh, yeah. uh, Kamani Vidal. Kamani Vidal. Uh, I, I think we need I, I, we need a size guy, though. Like That's why I'm getting sure. Dylan Johnson with the size that he brings. Yeah. Um, obviously, our FMA, our Notre Dame running back, Thunder to the Lightning, <laughs> is, is something to keep an eye on here. I just like I just want to know what's going on. Let's keep an eye out there. Like, um, someone in our chat. Zinter. Someone in our Zinter chat was suggesting the next O-line. pick would be nice as well. well yeah, Zach Zinter would say, be a nice pick next round. If he falls there. So I think, uh, do we go, I think we go Jalex Hunt right here. He, he did meet with the Bills, fits a need. And then, let's it see, feels right. safety-wise. And, and I'm, I'm not good with Jalex Hunt. I can make a Joe name. I'm, I'm good with uh, Jalex Hunt. I want to bring up Kitan Oladapo. If you're looking for that guy that was born and raised in Oregon and ended up going to Oregon State and then becomes the safety for the Buffalo Bills, it sounds like a really familiar storyline that I think that I've heard before. I'm not sure uh, if that is ringing a bell for any of the Bills fans out hmm. there, but um, Jordan Poyer was born and raised in Gooneyville on the Oregon coast, Astoria, Oregon, very further Oregon northern coast. Went to OSU, became starting safety, uh, drafted late. So Katana Lodapo, born and raised in the Portland suburbs, going to Oregon State University. Uh, the the similarities are are something that you read a poem about. It's full. But from a, a football standpoint here, I'm good with Jalex Hunt. I think that Katana Lodapo might be someone you can wait on a little bit and maybe get him in there. I'm still really mad to see Malik Mustafa gone. That's like my dream scenario in this range for the Bills is Malik Mustafa, so that's that's a bummer. Yeah. I think we could probably get Katana Ladapo at our next pick at 144. Maybe. So, Don't God willing. Solomon gone, Jordan Jefferson, Henderson, Jacobs. And we good. Remember, yeah, he's there. I'll do I'll do Oladapo here. Or is Zinter still here? Zinter oh, Javon is still Baker is still here, too. Hold on. Yeah, Von I just Baker. saw that. I just saw that name, too. Oh, if that Javon sucked. Baker has a free fall like this, that's How's that even stupid. possible? I know we've already it's seen not. it. I don't. It's not. He hates DBs. He can't fall He's this going, far. Javon Baker is going into, like, the 60 to 80 range. He's not. I think so. He might even slip into here. the back of the first round if. Somebody is really obsessed with the guy. I think second or third for Baker, but I don't think this far down. But we got our two. I don't want to get too greedy there. Um, especially and, it, with the and I want player. this draft to also be realistic. And I don't think getting Javon Baker at pick 144 is even slightly realistic in the scenario. So I'm sorry. Did you guys say Zinter was gone or is he still there? Zinter is still there. Yep. Oh, I think Zinter's good. I think Katana Ladapo would be a really nice pick here. Fills an absolute need. And I think yeah. you might be able to still get Zinter at 160. 
If you if you're confident in that, then I'll go for the safety. But I I'm concerned that he'll get poached. But I mean, we'll see. I mean, a guard I think is it's an upside move anyway. So I'll go Oladapo sure. if you guys want to. And then Javon Baker goes right after. Look at that. Carter finally goes to the Lions. That would be so sick. Johnny that Dixon gone. There's Zinter. Oh. He's gone. Dang. There goes my Zinter. Luke McCaffrey nice. to his Chiefs. We might have been able to get old Doppo. I might have just played the wrong hand. Um, okay. So let's take a look at what else we've got going on here. Running back was obviously something of mention for us. Uh, we might, I think we can wait a little bit for Kamani Vidal. I know definitely. a name that you guys both definitely have interest in. Uh, in terms of where we're at, let's take a look at what we've got so far. Again, Xavier Worthy at pick 35. Pick 60, Ricky Pearsall. 85, you got Mason Smith. Jalex Hunt at 128. And the Katan Oladapo at 144. We've still got 60, uh, or 160, 163, 200, 204, and 248. Yeah, I like this so far. I do. I mean, even with the some of the other players falling off the board that I would have liked, I think Jalex Hunt, for, for the sake of patience and how far he fell and landed in your lap, I like him a lot there. Oladapo's sure. a good pick. I'm, I'm cool with the way we're rounding it out, but uh, I think I'd just like to fortify the tackle or guard depth at some point. If Zinter couldn't do it, I mean, right now, if we're waiting on Vidal, I would like to address all line here. Um, and just okay. see who's floating. So, I mean, John, I'm not sure if there's anyone here that pops off the screen for you, at least as a depth piece. Uh, yeah, go to the guards here on the the list. Prince Pines. A little bit deeper. Awesome name. Prince is okay. Um, let's see. Scroll down a little bit. I want to see if there's anyone like real deep down that I'm a fan of. <laughs> Rank 400s. Hell yeah. Yeah, this this interior offensive line group got drafted super heavily in this mock. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a bit of a concern. Go to center. I want to see if there's... Narzad. Uh, uh, Kingsley. Drake Nugent Duke, there. He's Drake Andrew Nugent. Rame. Okay, so Andrew Rame at Oklahoma has a ton of experience. Um, he has like over a thousand snaps, if I remember right. His reps up. Um, but he is a guy that he's he's anything from an experience from a depth standpoint, not like at 160, but as a name last pick in the draft. You know, like 204, 248, one of those picks. You want to just get a depth guy in there that has three years of starting experience at center. Okay, sure. Let's take an Andrew Raymond, throw him in there as just an experienced guy who's played a lot of snaps. Um, interior offensive line in this class got rocked. I brought up Keith Randolph earlier as a name to watch mm-hmm. for like a depth guy on defensive tackle. That's still interesting to me. Gabe Hall at a Baylor. That's still a name that's Ooh. oh, he's still there. Interesting to me also. I think I just MJ saw that Deb- MJ Devonshire might be of interest too. Guy that we brought him for a Devin top Shire's thirty visit as well. I like Devonshire. I like Elijah Jones a lot too. I like Elijah Jones. That's a guy. That's a guy I'd be willing to go for as well. Man, we got options. What are the people feeling? What are the comments feeling? I've seen people ask about co- corners. I've seen people ask about backs. Curious. Taiki, Isaac Orendo, Christian Jones. Hmm. Now, Taiki is kind of interesting to me because he and Katan, I think, can do kind of different things. And I know kind of double dipping at safety is a little weird. But in a too high look that we have where you're wanting some, some youth and depth potentially in that secondary – I don't know. I can kind of understand it. The Taiki Smith, you brought it up earlier that he uh, previously worked out with or, or previously played with, with who was it that he's played with? Uh, the defensive backs coach, uh, Jamila yeah. Dai. So there's familiarity there, which I think is interesting. And Taiki Smith is an athletic guy that can come down into the box. Katano Ladapo is like a bigger safety, strong safety who can be a box guy, but also is going to be really, really strong in like run defense so uh, they're interesting if you want to get some cornerback depth here though i'm good with that too and i do think that devon shire's name that is going to be of interest to to buffalo yeah Yeah, either jones or devon shire is cool with me yeah i think devon shire is the fact that he was a top 30 visit the bills like to tackle that stuff and somebody mentioned it 
Uh, the Bills like their pit pit defensive back, so kind of fits that same mold right there. So let's go sure. ahead. We'll take sure. him, and then we have another pick in three anyway. We can uh, we can double down at this point. Take a look. Tyke, see there. I'll do. I'll do. Um, I'd be willing to do Tyke and just have the you know that not versatility, but I guess if you have two different skill sets, just add some young bodies to the safety room. I know Tyke Smith is you know I know Ant described him as an apex defender, so I mean I'd be willing to take that role on and have someone right. on that defense, like just more physicality. Yep. That's at this point in the draft, I'm willing to do that. So. Yeah, I definitely think it fits a couple needs. And to be honest with you, I mean, we only have Mike Edwards for one year. Right. We don't know what Taylor Rapp is. I mean, Taylor Rapp was fine, and you know, he's more of a missile when it comes to safety. But I, I don't want to have one guy knowing that. I mean, and maybe Mike Edwards is great. Maybe Mike Edwards ends up being the guy we extend him for a three, four year contract, and we're set. But I mean, at the very minimum, we saw what happened to our safety position. We got absolutely yeah. decimated in the past couple of years. And having that just back up behind is going to be so beneficial for us. So at this point, uh, I think, um, you know, we can look at a couple different directions, offensive guard, offensive line. Obviously, you know, it's Nugent. probably a little bit later. Um, yeah, we do have Nugent here, which is obviously an option. Uh, running back is definitely another one. Kamani Vidal at this point. I also like Carson definitely, too. Yep. Uh, you uh, guys Dylan tell me Johnson. what you guys think. Dylan Johnson is still out. I want to. I want to talk about him. Dylan Johnson at Washington. He battled through injuries through the second half of, of the season. He's a big boy. You saw it there, five eleven, two seventeen. Um, he's he's big. His athletic testing probably wasn't where you want to see it because I think he's still recovering from an ankle injury that he had. But he was a hammer. He was a guy that Washington leaned on so hard, especially down the stretch. Pac-12 mm-hmm. championship game. You guys know I'm an Oregon Duck guy. Washington oh, yeah. versus University of Oregon. Dylan Johnson iced the game. The fourth quarter, it was Dylan Johnson's show. He was the finisher, the guy that beat down the opposing defense, my Ducks defense. They couldn't tackle him. They couldn't get him down. You know, you're getting in those end-of-game situations – where you need a first down to ice the game. Okay, you hand the ball off two to three times to Dylan Johnson. You let the clock run out. You make the opposing team take their timeouts. He is going to finish, and he's going to punish, and he's going to run people over. Like, he's exhausting. He was exhausting as an opposing fan just to look at. It was it was rough, but I think that we need a youth infusion as the hammer in the Buffalo backfield, not just James Cook, who love, obviously, but as that thumper, as that guy that can come in and churn out the yards, Dylan Johnson is definitely a, a, a name that I like. I like his game more than K- Kamani Vidal. I know Kamani Vidal is a, a popular name, and I like that too, and if that's the pick, okay. But I just, I've got a soft spot for Dylan Johnson. I watched him get, you know, 31 carries for like 140, 160 yards, something like that against Oregon and just ice the game. And I'm just, God, and he was doing all that on a bum ankle. I'm just like, that's a grinder at the next level. That's not going to miss the game because he's nicked up, beat up. He's still going to fight through it. I don't know. We're going into, you know, you go into Arrowhead in the playoffs. I need a, a running back that's going to deliver the blow and not take the hit and bounce backwards. And Dylan Johnson's that kind of guy to me here. You know, t- pick 200 or later. I just, I've got a soft spot for him. I think he's going to be a really interesting and good running back at the next level. And I hope that he's on our team. Yeah, I support it. I definitely, I mean, I think that's just given his frame, given the weight, given the kind of, I won't call it bell cow ability, although I think he's he does have that. But the bruising ability yeah. and the fact that you're talking about, well, if I got Cook, who's going to go on the outside and be a bit more of a speedster pass catcher? This is just my dog. This is the guy that I could put in the goal line if I need to or short yarded situations. Yep. Kind of kind of what you wanted Harris and Murray to be. Like that, I think that role in a vacuum isn't one that you need to be overly complicated about. So I'm with it. Right. I would take Dylan Johnson. I don't even know if you need to do it right now, but if no, you want you to, then that'd be the option for me. To be he's, honest with you, might, even, he might even be a – he might even be a UDFA, to be honest with you. Maybe. He might not even need to actually get him, to be honest with you. So uh, at this point, do we go ahead and get an offensive lineman? 
a Drake Nugent, a guy that's kind of a jack of all trades. You can play him inside, outside, a little smaller, right? But somebody that I think has versatility, which I know they like a lot. Uh, and side note, Brandon Beaton didn't mention today about that bigger running back. So we know he's going to be targeting it. We know he's going to be looking after it. So that is obviously an, a pressing need. The other one I was looking at, I noticed was on here, is Ryan Flournoy is available uh, top 30 visit for the Buffalo Bills. I think that might be somebody that, you know, at 204, you know, get that third wide receiver, a guy that, I mean, he's a 989 RAS score. I, kind of honestly reminds me a lot of Malachi Corley, but it's going to be that later round version of him. So, is um, Anthony go Gold here? Did they take him? Is it, uh, he is. Oh, he is. He is. I'm, I'm also – that's one of my late-round guys because I think he's valuable for – not just because he's from Oregon, although that is a plus, I'm sure. Um, it's – it's yeah, it, the new return Special rules, teams, baby. Exactly. Yep. The new return mm-hmm. rules have to – are probably going to weigh heavily into a lot of the value you see on this board right now. I think a guy like him might actually go as high as like the fifth because of that. Because even if you get him as a valuable returner – that with the new rules could end up being massive, especially if you're talking about the difference of, well, we were conventionally touching back or starting at 25. Now we could base, if we have a good enough guy, get to the 30s and 40 yards of starting field position for a good offense consistently. So like, even though, yes, it is another receiver, I think this is a guy that's a specialist more than anything else. Yeah. One that you'll just let be your return, man. And I think value in that with the new rules is big. If it's me and I'm going to be psycho, my three picks for this final draft are Gould, Johnson, Nugent, and some order. Now, I think one of those, I love it. One of those has a chance to get poached, but if they get poached, so be it. But so I'd probably start with Nugent and Gould here. That would be my that'd be my take. And I like Johnson a lot, but I just feel like that that returner is going to be more valuable. I think so too. I mean this this new this new kickoff uh, format, you you really can't overstate it. Um, it's going to be really important. He's small. He plays big. He doesn't get knocked backward. He plays physically. His yak ability is really, really good. And that same yak ability translates. You just want the ball in his hands. Mm-hmm. Kickoff right. is where he can do that also. So you're looking at a guy in these new kickoff rules with that athleticism. I think he ran a 4 3 9 40, if I remember correctly. Um, he's fast. Like he, he can run. And you give him the ability. He was a special teamer in college also, so he has the experience and that the ability in that. Give him these new kickoff rules where defenders don't have that head start. Yeah, I think he's a guy that gives you plus field position if you're on a, a kickoff specialist uh, starter here. So, yeah, yeah, I think definitely really, really interesting pick. I think that's something that we need to address because I don't think we know who our starting kickoff returner is going to be. Okay, well, you right. don't want to risk one of your starting wide right. receivers, so give me a late round wide receiver that has experience doing that in athleticism. Yep. And yeah, I think that he really fits that mold. The other one that I was thinking is Satoa Lamea, um, mm-hmm. a bigger, bigger guard. I think he might be of interest oh, okay. just because he's kind of a grinder as well. Um, very similar to Osiris Torrance. I think he kind of fits that mold, run first, which obviously in Joe Brady's offense is going to be we're seeing. We don't know if it's just because of what was going on with the wide receiver core, if that was just kind of what he was leaning into. But potentially, if he is going to be utilizing the run more, having a guy like that who's you know a road grader is of interest. So you guys tell me, what what are your thoughts in terms of who's the next pick? I I right here want to lock down Nugent. That's me. Or, or, or um, yeah. Either Nugent or Satoa, because I think just interior offensive line hasn't been touched yet. So one of those two, based on your preference, then flip okay. over and probably go for either Gould or Johnson. And I think that's just going to be a toss up on what you value more. I think I, I am actually going to change my tune. I think the return matters for sure. But I do think that with Dylan Johnson, the upside is a little bit higher, even though Gould is going to be an awesome returner in the NFL. I think if Johnson's mm-hmm. fully healthy and you get that out of him this late in the game, that's a little bit higher for me. So I, I'll change my tune on that. But. Any of those three, give me at this point. But I don't think they'll all be there by 248 or whatever. Okay. Well, we are at 204, so we have any option of whoever we want. We already got Satoa. Uh, so we have everybody in front of at the on everybody in front of us at this point. So John, feel free, make the pick. Break the straw, John. I love that we're putting this much thought into this late in the game, by the way. This is my favorite part of mock drafting. Love it. I I love it. 
I, I want Anthony Gould. Um, I think oh. that's my that's my guy. I love what he can bring. I love he's he's potentially a, a depth starting slot wide receiver in the future. You never know how the future is going to get with some of the guys walk or their contracts are up or they're traded or whatever. He's a depth slot wide receiver and a special teams potential ace. Like I, I think that that is a very valuable pick to make this late in the draft with the number of picks that we have. Um, so I love it. I'm all in. Give me uh, my boy Eagle. I just think it's good at football. I want guys yeah, that are good at football. I think we finish off with Jordan McGee. I've finished off every single draft so far with the linebacker. Uh, love Jordan McGee out of Temple. Uh, gives you that one linebacker. I think they always need. Brandon Bean loves getting a good linebacker that has versatility at this point. So, did you yeah. uh, did you take Johnson earlier, or did you take uh, Satoa? Satoa. Okay, so it's Satoa and Gould. So we still need running back. Oh, correct. I to be honest with you, I mean, I think you might be able to get him. What is going on here? Oh, okay. I don't know why it stopped. I think you pr- honestly, you might still be able to get him as a UDFA. So I mean, we can obviously draft it for the sake of the the, the exercise here. But uh, let's get to it. Falls right in line to be honest with you at two forty eight. Getting a two fifty three running back will be good. Oh, I thought that was him for a second. Vidal gone. All right, we got we got okay. him. Yeah, Johnson. I'm happy with this. I'm very happy with this draft actually. So we will go at no Roy. We did not get a punter, unfortunately. <laughs> we might be able to find one later on. Okay, here we go. So, breakdown of the full draft, ladies and gentlemen. Xavier Worthy at the 35th overall pick. 60th pick, we won Ricky Pearsall, wide receiver out of Florida. 85, Mason Smith, defensive tackle out of LSU. 128, Jalex Hunt, uh, defensive end out of Houston Christian. At 144, John's guy, Katano Adapo out of Oregon State. Uh, 160, MJ Devonshire, cornerback out of Pittsburgh. 163, safety, Tyke Smith out of Georgia. Uh, Satoa Lomea, uh, guard from Utah at 200. 204, Anthony Gould, speedster, wide receiver out of Oregon State. And at 248, running back out of Washington, Dylan Johnson. So there we and are, guys. And a 2025 skin out of all. Yeah. And we still never use that 2025 second. That's nasty. So we still have two second round picks for next year, which is fantastic. Um, guys, love, love, love this draft. Why don't you guys just uh, real quick just recap what you're thinking head into this draft. Obviously, we're one week away from us being in Detroit. Real quick synopsis, and then we will uh, close this out. Yeah. Um, my My final piece... And I'm going to usher this sentiment on Tuesday. But just for fans, understand that there are multiple right paths to success for this team. If they do not trade up for a wide receiver in the top 10, it is okay. If they decide at 28 to go for defense, it is okay. I know that there is this urgency and panic because of the Diggs trade, and I get it 100%. And I will be happy if they decide to do any of those other two things, if they want to go get themselves a no dude say. If they think A.D. Mitchell, who might fall at 28, is their guy, take him. No problem. But I want everyone to understand that it is such a long process. There are so many options that are available to them in this receiver class to the point where I think it could sway them to go BPA. And if they decide at pick 28 or other parts in the draft that there's a different player of more value and they feel comfortable with it, Understand that there are multiple roads to getting back to the playoffs, to getting over the hump, to getting to a Super Bowl that don't just entail trading up for Romo Dunze, taking the yep. sixth best receiver over the second best D tackle at 28. Like there are other positions of need on this team, just as much as receiver, that I think you should address as well. And in a loaded class, that doesn't just mean that the top is the only spot that you can get viable production to your receiver room this year. It means Hey, there are three generational guys and a shit ton of depth after them that go into the second and third round. Bean maneuvers. Bean has options. Bean knows there are a lot of ways he can attack this. So if that one thing does not happen that you were hoping for, don't be discouraged. Wait till the draft's over and let's have productive conversations. Let's assess. Go Bills. Okay, I'm done. 
I just want to echo what Joe did. And like always, Joe being eloquent and wonderfully stated and, and saying the right things at the right time. I, I completely agree with that sentiment. What I love about this mock is that it does show a path to a very, very good draft that does not involve a job trading for a veteran wide receiver. If we walked away with Xavier Worthy and Ricky Pearsall both out of this draft class, oh my God, I'd be stoked. I would be incredibly th thrilled with that. You're getting two very talented wide receivers with different skill sets that Joe Brady is going to look at as chess pieces and figure out how to scheme them open and scheme their touches and, and all that. I just want it to be known that like this, this team is largely a good team. I know the Diggs trade is rough, rough to swallow. Trust me. I was stunned. We all were in the group chat. We were like, what the fuck just happened? Because we did not see it coming. It sucked. It sucks for us. It sucks for you. I get it as a Bills fan, but it doesn't mean that you have to press the panic button and run out there to be like, well, we have to trade up for Odunze. We have to trade for Brandon IU. We have to trade for T. Higgins. Don't have to. If that happens, great. Thrilled. Like Joe said, love it. Would love if that happens. And I'm like, great, plug-and-play veteran wide receiver or plug-and-play incredible rookie on a rookie contract, awesome. If not, though, the way that Joe Brady's offense maneuvers and manipulates defenders and put people in motion and all that stuff, now that he's going to have a whole offseason to prepare going into it knowing that he's the OC, I'm fine. I'm fine if we stick and pick at 28. I'm fine if we trade down. There's going to be a lot of options to get very, very talented players like Joe said, there's a realm of possibility. There's a wide receiver run before pick 28 that pushes maybe a Johnny Newton, maybe a Chop Robinson, maybe a, a position. Need. Cooper DeJean even potentially could be on the board at 28. There's a lot of avenues to success. Be open-minded. Let's be excited. And, and the biggest thing that I want to stress, these are kids realizing their dream of making it to the NFL, please treat them with respect when they get drafted. Don't tell them that they were a waste pick. And Bill's Mafia, I have high esteem for you. I believe that you're going to do the right thing. Don't go after these kids and tell them that it was a wasted pick and they should have done something different. Whoever we draft, get behind them, support them, welcome them to the Mafia. Let's go. Let's like rally around these guys. And we're going to do our best to put together the best roster that we can over the course of the summer heading into next season. So let's just be stoked. We have a lot of flexibility, a lot of options available to us. Beans can probably make multiple moves because it's what Brandon Bean does. And uh, we're, we're going to be stoked about it. And we're going to give you all that coverage from Detroit as those picks happen. Absolutely. And like John and Joe said, you know, this is there's a lot still in the works. We are one week away. Keep your head on a swivel. Don't be surprised. Don't be surprised with Brandon Bean if he decides to get a little excited and make make things happen. Uh, I'm not going to say exactly what that is, but uh, you know, Brandon Bean is always, always, always looking to better this roster, and he said it today. Um, you know, the phone works both ways. He is always listening. If a trade comes up to him, if it means and it makes sense to him, he'll trade a first round pick if it if it brings somebody in that's going to help this roster. So don't be surprised if it happens. Um, but don't be surprised if it doesn't. This you know, there's a lot of draft you know draft capital for us and a lot that's available to us. So I'm excited to see where we're at uh, coming up this week. But you know, again, John, Joe, and myself will be in Detroit one week from today. So again, make sure you hit us with a follow. Uh, if you like this episode, I know it was very wordy and long, but it's okay. Um, hit us with a thumbs up, share, like, re rate, review for us means the world. And as always, subscribe to the Cover One One Pass on the Cover One YouTube channel. So we will see you guys here. Jesus, next Thursday, we will not even be here. We will be there. We'll see you in Detroit, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go Buffalo. <laughs>